Dasa saw quite clearly how friendly his wife had become with Vishwamitra, how much she admired him and allowed herself to be admired in turn by this cool and courageous, though perhaps somewhat superficial and not over-intelligent soldier. With his healthy laugh and strong white teeth and well-trimmed beard, he watched all this with bitterness and at the same time contempt, deceiving himself behind a mask of scornful indifference. He did not spy upon them and desired to remain in ignorance as to whether their friendship had surpassed the limits of decency and the permissible or not. He observed that Pravati was in love with the handsome cavalier and treated the gestures which made it obvious that she preferred him to her all to unheroic husband with the same outward indifference and inner bitter weariness which he had now accustomed himself to look upon every event. It was all the same to him whether it were an inconsistency or a betrayal that she seemed so determined to play upon him or merely an expression of her lack of esteem. It was a fact and it waxed and developed against him like the war and destiny. There was no corrective and therefore no behavior possible other than an acceptance, a weary tolerance was now Dasa's brand of male heroism, as opposed to war and conquest. Whether their admiration for each other remained within the bounds of morality or not, Dasa realized in any case that it was less Pravati's fault than his own. He, Dasa, the thinker and doubter, was inclined to seek in her the cause of his waning happiness to make her jointly responsible for the fact that he had become inveigled into everything and entangled in it, in love, ambition, and in acts of revenge and plunder. He made woman and the love and lust in his thoughts responsible for everything upon earth, for the whole fandango, the whole chase for passion and desire, adultery, death, murder, and war. At the same time, he knew full well that Pravati was not guilty or the cause, but was herself the sacrifice. That she had neither created nor was responsible for her beauty or her love, but it was only a mote of dust in the sunbeam, a wave in the stream, and that he ought to have fled from woman, love, ambition, and the hunger for happiness, to have remained a contented herdsman, or to have overcome his own shortcomings through the mysterious path of yoga. He had either missed his opportunity, or he had failed. Either he had not been called to the great ones, or else he had been untrue to his vocation, and his wife was right in the last analysis she took him for a coward. On the other hand, he had obtained this son from her, this pretty, tender boy on whose account he was so fearful and whose existence still justified the meaning and value of life and who was even a great source of happiness, a painful and anxious happiness, but nevertheless, happiness, his happiness. This boon he was now paying for with the sorrow and bitterness in his heart, with the preparations for war and death, with the knowledge of going forward to meet his fate, some distance away in his own country sat Govinda, advised and cajoled by the murdered Nala's mother, an evil reminder of that seducer. His invasions and provocations grew ever more frequent and impertinent, and only an alliance with the mighty Raja of Gaipali would have made Dasa strong enough to compel him to keep the peace and to respect neighborly treaties. 
But this Raja, although well disposed toward Dasa, was related to Govinda, and had refused even the politest attempts to win him over for such an alliance. There was no way out, no hope of understanding or humanity. The fateful day approached and had to be endured. After this outbreak of concentrated attacks and a speeding up of incidents which could no longer be tolerated, Dasa almost began to long for war. He visited the Raja of Gopali once more and exchanged fruitless courtesies with him. In his counsels, he insisted upon the moderation and patience, but had long since adopted a perfunctory attitude and was without hope. In addition to this, he was arming. The difference of opinion in the council and now centered around the question as to whether the next invasion by the enemy was to be countered by a march into his own territory with a declaration of war or whether to await a major attack on the part of the enemy in order that he should be guilty of a breach of peace before the people and in the eyes of the whole world. The enemy, who did not bother himself with such questions, at last put an end to discussion, councils, and delays by striking. Govinda, this time, staged a rather larger expedition than usual, which enticed us along with his commander and his best troops to the border, and while they were on the way, launched his main forces upon the interior and particularly upon Dasa's capital, captured the gates and laid siege to the palace. No sooner had Dasa learned of this than he returned home immediately as he knew his wife and child would be imprisoned in the palace. Bloody fighting was in progress in the streets, and his heart bled when he thought of his near ones and their peril. He was now no longer the unwilling warrior, for he burned with pain and rage and rode home with his soldiers at breakneck speed. He found the battle raging in every street, cut his way through to the palace engaged the enemy and fought like a fanatic until, as night fell, he collapsed, exhausted, and with several wounds. When he recovered consciousness, he found himself a prisoner in the palace. The battle had been lost, and the palace was in the hands of the enemy. He was put in chains and brought before Govinda, who greeted him with scorn and led him to a nearby room. It was his own study with the carved and gilded walls and the papyrus scrolls. On a carpet sat his wife, Pravati, surrounded by armed guards, and in her lap lay her son. The tender figure lay like a broken blossom, dead, gray of face, and his garments saturated with blood. The woman did not turn her head when her husband was led into the room. She merely stared with expressionless eyes at the little dead body. She seemed curiously changed to Dasa, and only after some minutes did he notice that her hair, which a few days previously had been jet black, was now flecked with gray. She must have been sitting there for a long time with the boy on her knee, staring into space with her mask-like face. Ravana, cried Dasa. Ravana, my child, my flower. He knelt down, and his face sank onto the dead child's head, knelt as though in prayer before his speechless wife and child, lamenting for both of them, protecting them. He smelt the odor of blood and death mingled with the scent of flower oil in the child's hair. Pravati looked down at them both with a face of stone. He felt someone touch his shoulder. It was one of Govinda's men commanding him to stand up. He was led away. Neither he nor Pravati had spoken a single word to each other. Dasa was laid upon a wagon and brought to Govinda City, where his fetters were partially loosened. A soldier brought him a jug of water which he placed on the stone floor of the prison cell, and he was left alone 
behind barred doors. A wound in his shoulder burned like fire. He reached for the water jug and sprinkled water over his face and hands. He would have liked to drink, but forbore. He would long rather die and thought, how long would it last? How long? He yearned for death as his parched throat yearned for water. Only with death would the torture in his heart have an end. Only then would the picture of the mother with her dead son fade. But in the midst of his torment, weakness, and weariness took compassion upon him, and he sank to the floor and fell asleep.